Xabi Alonso's decision to stay at Leverkusen for next season has redirected media attention and online coverage towards Ruben Amorim of Sporting Club de Portugal as potential successor to Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool. Alonso's choice to remain in Germany, despite seeming destined for Liverpool, is commendable, given Leverkusen's undefeated streak in all competitions, their commending lead in a Bundesliga, and their promising European campaign. However, focus has now shifted towards Amarim, who has enjoyed considerable success resurrecting Sporting Club de Portugal. With the return of former Liverpool Sporting Director Michael Edwards to oversee the rebuilding process after Klopp's departure, the question arises, does Amarim fit Liverpool's criteria for a data-driven managerial selection process? In this analysis, we will delve into Amarim's managerial track record, his tactical philosophy and in-game management, and how he could potentially impact Liverpool's current squad. Amarim's journey from coaching Casa Pia and Braga's reserve team, the lead in Braga's main squad, and then subsequently Sporting Club de Portugal within such a short span is remarkable. His accomplishments include an end in Braga's 65-year winless streak against Benfica, securing a League Cup trophy, is a highlight of his managerial prowess, which, because of this, Sporting paid 10 million euros for his services, making him the third most expensive manager in history, and that investment produced instant success. The 2020-21 season marked a historic achievement for Amarim as he guided Sport into their first league title in nearly two decades, with the club losing just one league game all season. This coincided with Amarim's men breaking the longest unbeaten streak in Portuguese football's history with an impressive 32-game unbeaten run. Notably, this season also saw the rise of promising talents such as João Polinha and Pedro Porro, with both players subsequently making moves to the Premier League, and Nuno Santos and Pedro Gonzalez, who still remain vital components in his team today. Amarim's impressive talent identification also resulted in Gonzalo Ignacio, Nuno Mendes and Mateus Nunes getting promoted to the first team, with all three becoming some of Portugal's most highly promising players. During his time in Lisbon, He's also developed players such as channel favourite Manuel Ugarte, Usman Diamonde, Morten Hoymond and Marcus Edwards. And with the recent signings of Ivan Fresneda and of course Victor Gokoresh, who is now valued at around 80 million euros, the young coach really does have an eye for spotting diamonds in the rough. In his second season with Sporting, Amarim clinched the Portuguese Super Cup and the League Cup trophy, maintained a strong league performance finishing on 85 points, the same as the previous year, and making a notable impact in the Champions League. Despite a setback in the 2022-23 season, with Sporting finishing third in the league and a defeat in the cup final, the club's faith in Amorim remained, and once again Amorim showcased why he's one of the best coaches in the world. At the time of recording, Sporting Club de Portugal currently sit top of the league, with a game in hand over rivals Benfica and Porto. Following the disappointment of the previous season, Lisbon spent a club record fee of 20 million euros for Coventry's Victor Gokoresh, who has been one of the most prolific centre forwards across the whole of Europe. With 31 goal contributions in 25 games, the Swede has instantly become a Morum's talismanic figure in the capital, and he shows no sign of slowing down. With Sporting one point ahead of Benfica, with a game in hand like just mentioned, it's looking increasingly likely that he'll be crowned champions of Portugal for the second time under the aforementioned young coach. But how has he accomplished such a feat? In this section, I want to explore the tactical intricacies of Ruben Amorim's football philosophy, and uncover the formations, player dynamics, and overarching principles that have shaped Sporting Club de Portugal's strategy. I'll be delving into their defensive stability, right through to their fluid attacking sequences, highlighting the strategic elements that have driven their success and their ascendancy towards the top of Portuguese football. So, Amorim likes to set up his team in a 3-4-3 base, but like a lot of modern day approaches, there's less emphasis on a rigid structure, with positional awareness being the key importance. The initial phase of build-up play is heavily influenced by the opponent's style of pressing, which determines if they play out from the back in a low or high block. If they are against a side that likes to press their defensive line, then they'll set up in a low block, with the free centre half stretching out to apply that width, with the two number sixes dropping deeper, and the two wider players drifting centrally to form a box midfield. Amorim likes to play through the centre, so the box midfield creates that numerical superiority, which allows for quick movement and passing patterns to beat the pressure. With the four central midfielders all playing relatively close together, it means that they can receive and recycle the ball quickly, which minimises the possibility of the ball either being intercepted or a misplaced pass landing at the feet of one of the other teams in a dangerous position. 
It additionally allows the transition from the defensive to the midfield fair to be a lot more difficult for the other team to counteract, because if they do lose possession, they have a lot of players that can instantly apply that pressure and regain the ball back. Now, if the opponents are reluctant to press, opting for a more of a defensive approach, Amorim pushes his team up the pitch, creating a high line. In this build-up phase, the three centre-backs come a lot more centrally, so there isn't a need to create defensive width due to the amount of time they have on the ball. They still utilise the box midfield and use the wing backs to stretch the play out. The use of the two sixes in this pattern of play is crucial. One of them is naturally going to drop deeper depending on which side the ball is, whilst the other creates space for himself that allows for that quick interchange in pass. Like mentioned earlier, employing that high defensive line and the box midfield allows for that numerical advantage which creates space for the advanced players to rotate into. With most teams fielding a back four, that numerical superiority as they transition into a 3-2-5 will naturally create space for one player, whether that's one of the wing backs down the touchline, one of the tens dropping into that half space, or the number nine being able to run into that channel. When the opposing team shifts its defensive formation to one side, the weak-sided fullback becomes susceptible to the long switch of play, facing that numerical disadvantage against Sporting's wing back and the attacking midfielder. Amorim side likes to exploit this because directing a ball to the wing back generates numerous goal scoring opportunities from 2v1 situations on the flank and in the half spaces. They can also manipulate that number's advantage with coordinated movements between the striker and the attacking midfielder. As the wide centre back initiates possession, the striker makes a penetrative run into the channel, whilst the number 10 drops deeper to provide that passing option. This tactical manoeuvre presents a dilemma for the opposing defender which is either to commit to pressing number 9, which results in vacating space in the defensive shape that the number 10 can run into, or remaining rigid in the defensive line and just hoping for an offside or an imperfect touch. When it comes to possession in the final third, Amorim's men are highly effective at generating goal scoring opportunities in and around those half spaces, and this is where a lot of their goals come from. That 5 vs 4 scenario causes a lot of problems for the other team if their defensive midfielders aren't quick enough to stop the run into the 18 yard box. From there, the number 10s can either have a shot at goal themselves or whip the ball into the box. Amorim likes to overload his team into the opponent's penalty area, with 4 or 5 players overloading the space which means there's always going to be an option for the inevitable cross and the numbers support that. In 26 league games, Sporting have scored 77 goals 16 more than anyone else in Portugal, so with an average of 2.96 goals per 90, to my knowledge they have a higher goal to game ratio than any other team in Europe's top 5 leagues. Whilst, with respect, the Portuguese league isn't as competitive as say, Premier League or the Bundesliga, averaging just over 3 goals a game is seriously impressive, and a positive sign that that number could be somewhat replicated with the potential step up. When Sporting aren't in possession, they like to transition into a 5-2-3, and whilst that sounds somewhat pragmatic, and kind of the opposite to how Jürgen Klopp sets up, their defensive properties are actually very similar in some regards. Both Amorim and Jürgen Klopp like to use a high line, which means with the correct defensive profiles, makes chance creation harder for the opposition. Like Klopp, Amorim's team is one of the most intense presses in the league, with every player coming together as a collective to regain the ball. Once engaged in pressing, the attackers aim to channel play outward, with the wider attackers adjusting their press from inside to out. The double pivot often staggers their positioning, with the nearest pivot ready to step in if needed. By positioning the higher player of the double pivot between the opponents, he can defend just ahead of the nearest wing back, decide who to press based on the direction of the opposition's next pass. The opposition advances beyond the first line, manages to find a pass out wide, the wing backs aggressively press. The second player in the double pivot would then cover the central lanes or be prepared to drop between the centre backs, particularly if one of the wider centre backs has shifted across as the wing back steps up. The wing back on the far side would then narrow to provide additional protection ahead of the centre backs in the central area. And this setup also encourages the double pivot to adopt a more assertive, staggered positioning and make more decisive moves to press the ball. And Room's team like to employ a crucial pressing trap as well. The front line pushes the ball wide, one wing back advances from the defensive line, while the far sided wing back remains in the back line to establish a back four. And from that point, the double pivot would aggressively shift across the pits to maintain pressure on that side. In these situations, they are less likely to stagger their positioning in the second line, focusing instead on preventing the opposition from playing centrally. The pressing wing back would cut off the passing touch line, whilst the nearest centre back stands ready to track any wide runners. The remaining defenders position themselves to contest aerial duels, 
or intercept any switches of play. At the same time, the front line would continue to press the ball, particularly the two wide forwards, with the nearest forward pressing from behind to keep play wide. The centre forward would hold their position to obstruct passes through the centre of the block, whilst the forward on the far side adjust their positioning based on the opposition's strengths. For example, if the opposition excels at switch and play, the far side forward drops back into the second line. However, if a Morum seems it's worthwhile to take more risks, say if they're drawing and need a goal for example, this play remains high up the pitch and prepared to transition quickly or press high in response to a triggering pass. So, whilst Klopp and Amorim share some tactical similarities whilst out of possession, their positional patterns are very different, so it could take time for Amorim's difference of strategy to be implemented to full effect. So, to summarise, I think the potential appointment of Ruben Amorim is a very exciting one, but of course it does come with some uncertainty. Of course, he's a great manager, but being an excellent coach outside of the Premier League doesn't always translate into having the capabilities to coach a team as big as Liverpool. Not only that, filling the mantle left by Jurgen Klopp is going to be a massive challenge in itself. Not only that, with Klopp currently being the longest serving manager in the league, he's drilled this philosophy into the club for the last decade, so a sudden change of tactics and patterns of play will take time to get used to. Nevertheless, he's a fantastic tactician, and despite only being at the beginning of his managerial career, He's already shown in abundance that he can coach and develop young players, which is very important in Liverpool's next chapter. Amongst the senior players like Mo Salah, Van Dijk, Robertson and Alisson, Liverpool's team is made up of a core of young players that still haven't reached their peak years. So, transitioning into a new manager that understands the importance of allowing young players to develop is crucial. Also, like Klopp, Amorin is a very good man-manager, which I think is a necessity. Because, love or hate him, Klopp is probably the most adored manager in the world when it comes to his relationship with not only the fans, but the players. Our team constantly give their 100% for him, which should seem natural, but isn't always the case. So I can't express the importance of getting a manager that not only is emotionally mature, but wants to embed themselves into the club's culture and future. I'll be perfectly honest, Amarim wasn't necessarily my first choice. I think that's probably clear but that doesn't mean I'm not excited by his potential arrival. Liverpool as a club in the last decade has been built on unlocking hidden potential and this could be another one of those instances where we take a promising idea and turn it into history. Who knows? Time will tell. If you've made it this far and enjoyed the video, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. I just want to say a quick thank you as well for 1000 subscribers. I know I'm not the most you know, consistent of content creators but I'll never just churn out videos for the sake of it. You know, I always like to speak on the heart and, and that process will eventually become a lot more consistent. So yeah, thank you for sticking with me. With that being said though, let me know your thoughts on Ruben Amorim. Is he the right man for the job? Let's discuss it in the comments. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you soon.